Well, the lake has been closed for several weeks because the fish have been spawning, but they've had a bit of a break now. I think they're all fully recovered and I've had a couple of days surface fishing already and the surface fishing is well and truly kicking off. I've had a handful of really nice fish and I've had one very big fish, but I'm back down today and I'm gonna have another go on the surface and see if we can catch a few for the camera. Surface fishing has got to be one of my favorite ways to catch carp, it's so exciting. But there's a few little tips I can give you that will make it a lot more productive. And first of all, my setup, my rod and my reel. I use a two and a quarter pound test curve rod with a 15 pound main line and a 12 pound hook link. Now that's probably a bit heavier than some people use for surface fishing, but Homersfield is slightly different to other lakes. There's quite a bit of weed in here and there's some very big carp in here. So it's pointless me scaling down to six, eight pound hook links if I'm just gonna lose fish when I hook them. So I, I fish for fish and I don't wanna hook fish unless I feel I can actually get them in the net. So I fish a little bit heavier, knowing that I might not get quite so many bites, but I land the fish that I hook. I really like these bolt machine type surface floats. You can use them at any range and they're probably about 90% effective of self hooking. So if I can't quite see my hook bait, I still normally know when a fish has grabbed it because the water just erupts. And the hook bait itself is a whittled down pop-up. And the reason I use a pop-up, if I was to put a real chum mixer on the hook, A, the roach in here would just batter it to death until it comes off the hook. Plus they soak up water quite quickly and lose their buoyancy. And by getting a pop-up boilie, which is a similar color to a dog biscuit, trimming it up with some scissors so it's a similar shape to a dog biscuit, I've pretty much got a bait on the hook that I can use all day. And when I say a bait on the hook, I hair rig them. And it's very important to fish a neat, tidy presentation, either a size 10 or a size eight hook. And when I hair rig it, it wants to be a really short hair. It wants to look like you've super glued the boilie to the back of the hook. And that's basically it, a three to four foot hook link, a bolt machine, and a perfectly balanced setup. Well, one of the first jobs with my float fishing, especially here, is it, there's quite a bit of bird life here at Homersfield, and rather than fighting against them all morning, dog biscuits aren't particularly expensive, so if you Take your time to feed off the birds. If it, if it takes half a sack of biscuits just to feed all the birds up, once they've got a belly full of biscuits, they'll normally leave you alone. So I've spent half an hour just feeding, feeding, feeding. The birds have all ate loads of dog biscuits and they're all now slowly disappearing, leaving me with just a swim with some carp in. So then it's a case of little and often with the dog biscuits, keep trickling them out, building the confidence of the carp and trying to trick one into eating my hook bait. deciphering what's a carp and what's a giant roach smashing in the dog biscuits. That didn't take long. I think I've probably skillfully picked one of the smaller fish in the swim this time, but it's nice to get a bite. But he's, uh, he's certainly pretending to be a lot bigger. He's scrapping quite hard in this shallow, weedy water. But I did see it come up and take the biscuit and it looked like a small common carp. But hopefully it won't be the only one of the day. They're, they're now taking the biscuits quite confidently. So I'll get this little fella in and see what the next one is. It's important to take your time on this, this floater gear. That is only a little size 10 barbless hook. So. As I previously mentioned, with a lighter Tesco rod, a two or a two and a quarter pound Tesco rod, it's a little bit more forgiving. So, as long as your setup's balanced and you play them nice and steady, you'll be surprised what you can land on this gear. And even these smaller fish are good fun on this floater gear as well. Come on, little fella. Lovely. Well, the fish is safely in the net, and before I get him on the unhooking mat, I'm just going to top the swim up and, like I say, little and often feed and just keep 
trickling biscuits through the swim. If you feed too heavy, your biscuits will drift down into the next swims and you'll actually push the fish out of your swim. So just a pouch full or two every other cast normally. And I can see they're taking them already, they're straight on them. Well, I suppose the one advantage to the barbless hooks is normally once I've netted a fish, the hook just falls out once you take the pressure off. So I'm not gonna put this little fella through any unnecessary stress by getting him on the unhooking mat. We'll just have a quick look at it. Lovely little mirror carp. But there's fish probably three times as big as that out there. So I'm quite keen to cast out again. Well, after that first fish, I check my hook point after every single bite. It's so important to have a sharp hook when doing this style of fishing. And again, with the low diameter hook link, you wanna make sure that that's not damaged at all. So if it doesn't look 100%, it doesn't take you a minute just to tie another one, but having everything absolutely perfect is very important. And with a lot of these really sharp hooks, the, the points are quite fragile, so I've got plenty of hooks. I'm just gonna tie up a new hook link before I recast. You get paranoid that they can see your hook or see your line, but if you watch them, they, they miss quite a few of the free offerings. They're just probably a little bit of a guesswork when they get to that last six inches when they're about to take them. So I don't think they do shy away from the line. I think they just misjudge it sometimes. Just missed it. <laughs> Close. Whoa, there's a bit of weed growing up in this swim now, so that's, I'm quite glad I've got that 12 pound hook link. This one feels a bit better than that first one. That was certainly a bigger pair of lips that came up and he's holding his ground a little bit more. Just try and keep him up out of that weed. This is where you have to trust your knot tying skills and that everything holds up, but we should be okay. This is real enjoyable fishing, but it's quite heart stopping fishing at the same time on this, this gear, but keep the rod nice and high at this point. Then if, if he has one last minute lunge, you can just dip the rod down, but you get those heart stopping moments when your line just pings off a fin or something, but come on, mate, he's getting tired. Here we go. Don't forget, keep the biscuits going in. That fish has just gone in the net and two pouchfuls of dog biscuits. I think we might pop this one on the mat and have a proper look at this one. Well, hopefully this one will behave for the camera. This is a real hard fight in common, this one. I should think it's probably a big double if I had to guess, but I'd say it's a very angry common. And for the look of the shape of it, recently spawned out, but a real fighting machine. Big old tail and a real long fish. Brilliant fun on the floater gear. What I really like about the floater fishing is the minimalistic tackle side of it. You don't need a barrel full of gear and you haven't got to sit here for days on end. If you've got half a day, just a morning or an evening, when the conditions are right, you can get a few bites. So for me, if I'm busy at work and I just get an evening spare, I always reach for the floater rod. Another thing I quite enjoy about this style of fishing is it is possible to target the slightly bigger fish. You can actually see them taking the baits off the top and having a decent set of Polaroid glasses is a big edge as well, but it doesn't get any more exciting than watching fish taking baits on the top. And when you see one of the bigger fish out there engulf your hook bait, it's real heart in the mouth kind of stuff. It's quite important to keep, keep an eye on your hook bait at all times. You don't want to be hooking a duck, so just be aware what's going on out there. And normally when the ducks come in, you can just pull it out of the way. 
Sometimes I'll feed down the margin and just keep the ducks out of the way. But they're not being too much of a pain today, touch wood. There's some nice fish out there now. Here's one little handy tip for when you're using these surface floats. I tie a figure of eight loop, which I then loop to loop onto the eye of the swivel. But I make the loop quite big. And the reason for that is you've then got a bit of doubled up mono coming from the float. It's a bit stiffer, so it kicks it away from the float and it makes that last few inches a bit tougher near the float. So there is a, a reason why I tie an overly large loop. And that just makes it a bit more durable. And like I say, acts as a kicker. He's right near my hook bait. He's like two biscuits away. Come on. Oh dear. Oh, go on. Yes. That was one of those determined, slow. Whoa, whoa. I've actually got 15 pound line on this reel and I feel I need it with this weed out here today. Certainly doesn't feel like a small, small one. It's the thing in here, the, the next fish to come up, there are double figure fish, 20s, 30s, 40s, and even a couple of 50s in here, so you never know quite what's gonna take the biscuit next. I fish quite a loose clutch on the reel because I can always just put my hand on the spool to slow it down, but it just means if he catches me off guard and he wants to go for a run, I can just let him run. You can see fish taking the biscuits whilst I'm playing this one. Oh, lovely. Well, I'd rather him fight quite hard under the rod tip than out there over that weed, so... In you come. And there we are, fish number three of the morning. And another very hard fight in common. Brilliant take, that one came up really slow. Never looked like he was going to miss the dog biscuit. Sort of takes I really like. It's not a bad thing, especially after the fish has spawned. He's just got a little saw patch there. So I've got a little bit of this ulcer swab, clinic type stuff. Just if there's any missing scales or any little blemishes, we want to try and keep the fish in top condition. So that won't do him any harm at all. Thank you, mate. You can go now. As we move towards the end of spring and into early summer, obviously we're always looking for signs when the uh, fish are gonna start spawning. Normally here, uh, the roach seem to spawn first, and that's all obviously always depending on the weather. Then the carp follow with the tench um, and the bream all around the same sort of time. Um, this year saw the fish start spawning sort of end of May. I look at the lake very differently so maybe to other people. I like to close the lake uh, a few weeks before the fish spawn um, and also obviously after they spawn as well. I find that the benefits from that is that it allows the females especially to develop their eggs, allow them to just settle down and rest and not be put under pressure for fishing. As soon as the water temperature is raised just by a few degrees, uh, all the fish here spawned very quickly. Um, it's an amazing sight to watch. You see droves of carp coming to specific areas, um, especially where it's very reedy. And uh, we have hundreds of fish here that are spawning. Um, so it's a really nice way to just have the lake closed beforehand so that they can get on with that and allows them to have a couple of weeks rest afterwards. Um, some fisheries stop fishing when as soon as they start seeing signs of the fish spawning. Um, but for me personally, I prefer to allow the fish to rest before they start spawning um, and I feel it just gives them a better start. They do it quicker, get it over and done with, um, allows them to get back on the feed and a few weeks after that it allows me to allow, have members back so they can fish again. For me, the benefits of having a closed season, and it doesn't have to be like it was in the old days when it was from March until June, but I still think that there should be a period of time that lakes are closed, um, so it just allows the fish to rest naturally before and after spawning. It's funny, now that we're doing the filming here and watching the drone shots, you can see the real large fish that are really heavy in spawn um, swimming awkwardly, um, and they need that time to rest that they can spawn 
without any sort of interference from anglers. Also at the time for me, if I have my members here catching fish that are full of spawn, especially the big fish, it's not really very good for the fish to be lifting them out of the water, holding them. There might be an accident or something. Um, and again, for the welfare of the fish, I don't think that's really beneficial. So for me personally, I would rather have the lake closed before and after spawning um, and everybody wins. The fish benefit from it. Um, as a fishery owner, I benefit from it. And honestly, I think the members benefit from it as well. Well, I've been trying to target one of the slightly bigger fish in the swim this morning and I finally connected with one. I've been, take my glasses off, I've been watching this one run circles around me all morning. So after a run of sort of smaller fish, it's nice to connect with a bigger one. Well, as much as I enjoy the fight on this gear, I'll be quite pleased when this one goes in the landing net. He's got a nice big wide set of shoulders on him and he's in the net. Lovely. A bit of an old character, this one. Not quite as big as it looked when it came up and took the floater. A mid-20, this one. Just under 25, if I'm honest. But another cracking common carp and another brilliant scrap on the floater gear. Proper gnarly old common carp. Huge, great big tail, big peck fins. No wonder it's scrapped. Thank you, mate. Off you go. I'm not sure that carp fishing gets any better with the sun on your back and playing one on the floater rod. Playing a very hard fighting fish at that. Off he goes. It was hard work for a little while because the, the wind picked up a bit and it made the floater fishing a bit tricky. But the wind's dropped slightly and the sun's come out and I've managed to hook another one. The sun certainly seems to switch the carp onto the surface feed and as soon as they feel the sun on the backs, they all come up in the water. And normally, if you're patient and you keep trickling the dog biscuits out, you'll get them feeding. Well, mirror carp this time, and a nice fish this one. I have just popped it on the scales at, I think it was £27.6. Another cracker and another one off the top. Well, I think that might be the last fish of the day for me. It's been a brilliant day surface fishing, and without a doubt, it's one of my favourite ways to catch carp. Thank you very much so exciting watching it all happen in front of you but that moment when they do take your hook bait well you can't beat that in my opinion and i've had a great start here the last few days at homersfield i've had numbers of carp i've had 20 pound carp 30 pound carp and i've even had a 40 pound carp off the top what a great day surface fishing Waveney Valley Lakes really came into the public eye from about 1971 when uh, Peter Stacey had caught the two 30 pound carp from the complex. And at the same time, a year later, um, we had the chance to buy a property called Fisher's Green, which was located in, near Waltham Abbey on the River Lee. This turned out to be a 25 acre site, which had two lakes on it, one of about two and a half acres, uh, one of eight acres, and the River Lee split the two lakes, um, which was about a mile and a bit long. Also, it came with a derelict 400 year old house. So as a family, the idea was to rebuild the house and move there as soon as possible. The lake, the small lake, which was at the back of the house, the two and a half acre lake, um, we totally drained it down and cleaned it out. There was no fish in there. And the idea was to stock it with large fish that we again were bringing in from Belgium, where some of the fish were going to Waveney Valley and the rest of the fish were coming to Fisher's Green in Essex. The eight acre lake and the stretch of the River Lee, um, we ended up allowing the uh, Metropolitan Police Angling Society to have um, and any of their members could come and fish there. So in a sense, uh, we always had members of the police around the, around the property, which is uh, rather nice. Um, again, we stocked the lake there with carp that we were bringing in 
Having Fishers Green allowed us to bring even more fish in from Europe um, and we were continuing to do this and bringing these fish in from Belgium. In fact, on one consignment, uh, I know for a fact that we brought in three tonnes of fish over 30 pounds and that equates to about 188 fish. Um, so much has been talked about Fishers Green uh, by people and written in books and I can assure you that most of it is wrong um, and so it's quite nice for me to be able to put the record straight on many things with that. The house lake as I'll call it, um, I only fished it, I don't know, not as many times as people think I fished it um, but each time I was very fortunate to catch some very large fish two occasions. One was a 31 pound mirror which hit the front page of the Anglian Press and then in 1976 in September I was fishing it um, and I had a, a stunning, well, virtually a leather carp, not really a mirror carp. It weighed in at a staggering 45 pounds 12 ounces. Now of course we were fully aware that the British record at the time was 44 pounds from Richard Walker in 1952 and we didn't want to bring attention to ourselves or to make any claim to anything else but we certainly didn't want to claim the British record at the time. Unfortunately when I was catching this fish there was a few police officers on the other side of the bank watching me do this um, and they came round and it took them some time to come round and we quickly changed the scales and also doctored the scales so that when we weighed it in front of them it weighed 42 pounds 12 ounces. A staggering fish at the time in 1976 but luckily it wasn't going to be claimed as a British record. A couple of the policemen had friends who one was a photographer and said that they would make a phone call, went to our house, phoned their friend and their friend came over and photographed the fish. We didn't mind them doing that, um, again we thought the, uh, the pictures would be nice for us to have. Uh, the first time we saw the pictures they'd hit the front covers of all the leading uh, the Angler's Mail and the Angling Times. Many people wonder why didn't we claim the record at the time. It's quite simple really. Um, we knew there'd be controversy over it. We knew that we'd stock the fish in as large fish. And maybe in today's world, people wouldn't think like that. But we really didn't need the publicity. Uh, Waveney Valley Lakes was already then maybe one of the most popular fishing destinations in the UK. Um, so it didn't, really, it didn't really bother us at the time. Um, I was young, I was only 13 years of age. Um, and I think um, it was a very wise decision not to, uh, to take that record. Um, I know Richard Walker wrote to me and I met him and talked about it. Um, he congratulated me. Um, the British Carp Study Group at the time claimed it was the biggest mirror caught on record. So I suppose in some respects I did have one record. It was just very nice to be able to catch such a fish. Uh, we were inundated with people asking if they could come and fish it. On one occasion, our good friend Jack Simpson asked if Kevin Maddox could come along and uh, if he could fish it with the intention of trying to catch a British record. I don't quite know why, but my dad allowed that. And uh, we had a whole day's fishing there, me and Kevin. Um, I had a couple of fish, I think Kevin had one fish, but again, they weren't the size of fish that he was looking for. By 1974, the importation of carp had been stopped from Europe and we had made the uh, decision to build the first really commercial carp farm um, in the UK and uh, that most probably finished around about 1976. It was built and ready to go and uh, that was the next stage of our lives really. We started producing carp um, at Fishers Green which would go on to produce hundreds of thousands of fish and be stocked all over the UK.